Lorraine Herring's current project is a constellation of ghosts, a speculative memoir with ravens. She's the author of three books on writing from Shambhala Publications. Writing begins with the breath, embodying your authentic voice. The Writing Warrior, discovering the courage to free your true voice. And On Being Stuck, tapping into the creative power of writer's block. Both Writing Begins with the Breath and The Writing Warrior were included on Poets and Writers Top Books for Writers list. Her book, Lost Fathers, How Women Can Heal from Adolescent Father Loss, was released from Hazelden in 2005. She's written three novels, Ghost Swamp Blues, Gathering Lights, and Into the Garden of Gethsemane, Georgia. Her nonfiction has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize, and her fiction has won the Barbara Deming Award for Women. Her work has most recently appeared in Tiferet, The Manifestation, and Quiet Storm, among many others. She teaches writing nationally at the Kripalu Center, is that Kripalu, okay. Um, the Omega Center, 1440 Multiversity, and at many writers' conferences. She holds an MFA in fiction writing and an MA in counseling psychology. Lorraine is currently the director of the creative writing program at Yavapai College, which many of you have been through or to, where she is a tenured professor of creative writing and psychology. Please welcome Lorraine Herring. Oh, y'all. Um, so thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, it's really a privilege to share this with you tonight, and I would really like to specifically, I'm not going to name names because I'll leave somebody out, but um, really say so much thank you to the community that I have found in Prescott, um, both here at the college and um, in my healing community and my friendship community. Um, many of you helped me write this book that I'm going to be reading from, whether you knew it or not, because you helped provide a space for me to heal and to get to know um, some of the many gifts of cancer. Um, when you get a cancer diagnosis, um, you learn a lot of things quickly, and one of them is who matters and uh, who shows up. And um, I have been so overwhelmed by how many people have continued to show up for me. Um, when I moved to Prescott in 2003 um, from Phoenix, I moved because I was specifically looking for community. I could not find it in Phoenix. I had lived there for 25 years. Um, and I had glimpses that that could happen for me here. And I have absolutely found it. And even though my heart will always be Southern, my home is in Prescott um, and it's because of you. And another reason it is a privilege to read this to you tonight is because I am actually alive here to read this to you tonight. So a little bit about the book, because it's kind of weird, because, you know, it's me. Um, and so uh, it's a speculative memoir, and what that means is it's a memoir that uses elements of magical realism um, to help explore the themes that, um, that, are, that are, you know, played out in the book. Um, most of you know I was diagnosed with colon cancer in 2017, but that is not the story of the book. Um, my father died in 1987 when I was 19, and um, to say that that particular event messed with me is an absolute understatement. Um, and in, in the book, and in one of the primary things I learned from dialoguing with cancer and dialoguing with the experience of illness is the sheer amount of unresolved grief that I still was carrying. And even after decades of therapy and after doing what you always do when you know you're messed up, you become a therapist. Um, so even doing that, you know, I was like, oh, okay, still, so there's more. So cancer basically became the catalyst for letting a lot of shit go. And the irony that the cancer was in the organ that's in charge of letting shit go was absolutely not lost on me at all. Um, so I sort of play with that you know, in the book as well. The book has two dialoguing <coughs> forms. One section is told in more of a lyrical essay format, and the other is told in a stage, uh, stage play format um, with the characters of me, 
Raven, um, Raven's mother and Raven's father. Raven represents the voice of my father, uh, my father's ghost, and the two forms work off of each other to show different perspectives on the themes of the book, so it's a hybrid form in that way. The lyric essay portions reveal the literal things that happened while the stage play format works with the mythological and symbolic things that happened. Um, so in the very, very beginning of the book, I explore the dissociation of the cancer diagnosis and through that bring the reader into the mythical world where we meet the character of Raven, who as I said, represents the ghost of my father. And this sets up the two different worlds and the thematic questions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read one essay from the beginning of the book, and that's in the traditional lyric format, and then a short piece um, also in the beginning of the book from Raven's voice, um, which is the stage play format. And the whole book is basically a conversation between those two things. Um, the premise of the book is, I was busy doing other things when cancer came, and my father, 30 years dead, returned to me as a raven. Does a ghost have breath? I wake up asking this after undergoing a lower anterior resection to remove a two inch malignant tumor from my sigmoid colon. The plastic tubing from the oxygen tank claws at my nostrils. Who am I breathing in? Who am I breathing out? Months after I'm released from the hospital, I will still feel the pinch of the tubing. I will still feel tethered to the single bed with the plastic sheets. I'm on the sixth floor at Honor Health Scottsdale Shea Medical Center in the oncology recovery ward. My window looks out over the roof of the adjoining building. A small TV mounted to the wall gets a dozen channels, including an odd compendium of National Geographic videos of frolicking animals. I keep that station on in the background. I like the big cats with their big paws. Every time a baby is born in the hospital, a soft lullaby is played over the speakers. There is no such marker for death which bothers me. Marking only a birth and not a death is whitewashing life. I don't say anything. A pattern I am realizing has not been useful. But each time I hear the soft xylophone music, I wonder how many people have died in between the births and how many people are standing numb or relieved or exhausted or manic in sterile rooms beside the shell of a human who had mattered to them. If I were to die here, I would want a song. Five incisions etch my belly, each carved out by the room-sized Da Vinci surgical robot named Eva, who handled the bulk of the cutting and stitching, while my surgeon, swathed in light blue from head to toe, controlled her from behind a computer screen. My colon, glittering with malignancy, exposed to the air and enlarged on stadium-sized screens around the operating room. Robot kisses, I call the bites, and my husband will kiss each one as they fade from black and blue and red to gray to ash to shadow. Today, the day following the surgery, my abdomen is a paintball field of colors and I can't sit up on my own. In addition to being attached to an oxygen tank, I am tethered to a catheter, a steady stream of glucose food, which in the months past surgery will turn me briefly into a pre-diabetic, and a morphine drip, time released of course, so that I can't slip too far away. Who am I breathing in? Who am I breathing out? I don't want the morphine, and they tell me I'm not using it enough, so they will be taking it away from me tomorrow. I want to feel everything, because feeling everything means my body is alive and fighting for itself. Pain tells me I'm still here. If I numb my body, what might it do, and where might it go without me? I can't numb the pain without numbing my mind, and I must remember everything. I am frantic to remember everything. I want to stretch into every cell to run my tongue over every limb, every toe and finger, every scar and splash of cellulite. I've tried to hide and whisper, hello, I see you. I am here now. Singing bowl chakra music plays on my iPad while the big cats frolic in silent non-HD quality. The computer station to my right flashes its constant screensaver about the dangers of MRSA. The man in the room next to mine moans. He will moan for three days before he's gone. I won't know whether he died or was moved to another location. There will be no song to tell me. I'm alone now. My family has gone home to rest and I'm supposed to snuggle into the balm of morphine, but I can't, I won't. Pain is its own narcotic, and its waves and crests are surfable once I find their rhythm. 
It's been 17 days since I was told I had colon cancer. I have two master's degrees, but prior to learning this news, unless we were discussing punctuation, I could not have told you the various functions of the colon. I could not have told you about the virtues of various kinds of enemas. I have had three colonoscopies in 23 days, a CT scan, an MRI, and a six and a half hour surgery. I have been under general anesthesia three times and drunk and vomited gallons of Miralax and Gatorade. I am emptied out. I also had a pedicure. And I asked my hairstylist to cut five inches off my hair and add gold streaks in it so I would sparkle like fireworks. On my last day of work before going on family medical leave, a colleague said, that's so you, about to go in for major surgery and you get your hair done. It may seem frivolous, but I love hair, and I love fashion, and I love presenting myself as art. But I also didn't know what might happen next. Would I lose my hair? Would I get weaker? Would they find something in surgery they didn't see in the scan? Would I die in the operating room of some other undiagnosed problem? I couldn't control those things, but I could choose to cut my hair before it fell. I could choose to sparkle in sterility. When I am removed from the catheter in a few days, the nurse who will help me walk to the bathroom will comment on my toes, each nail a different bright color. I love them, she will say. They match your cool personality. What I don't know the day after surgery, but will know very soon, is that those pre-op choices, perhaps wasteful to an outsider's gaze, help me be seen as a person to a team of caregivers who treat dozens of people in the same green gowns, in the same rooms, over and over again. I needed to assert, see me, remember me, help me. A whiteboard hangs beneath the television with my name, Lorraine Herring, written across the top. Today is Saturday, March 11th, 2017. The weather is sunny, 86 degrees. Dr. Kassir, nurse Karen, and then a box filled with secret words I don't understand that tell the nurses what I can and can't do, eat, drink, or take. I stare at the letters and numbers, glyphs of many undecipherable codes that will surround me in the coming months. The codes are a slammed door. They are about me, but I am denied access to their meaning. The doctors are using my superpower, words, to alienate me, and I am furious and terrified that I did not anticipate that. With all of the possible tragic outcomes, I never considered the inevitable one, language, my always and forever safe house, could turn on me. Words will become paragraphs of horrors that keep the doctors on one side of the table, and me, the one embodying the subject of the conversation, mute, unable to participate. I'm surprised every time I catch a glimpse of my bruised belly. Had I really thought they could cut into it without leaving fingerprints? I turn onto my right side, away from the window, fire shards of pain clenching my abdomen. I won't push the morphine button. Pain grounds me to the bed. The wide door is closed and there is only me, thousands of dollars of flashing, beeping equipment and a ticker tape of MRSA warnings. Oh, and well, there are also the ghosts. 30 miles across town, in a hospital that is now part of the Banner System, but was then Thunderbird Samaritan, is the hospital where my father died 30 years ago in 1987. There was no song to mark his leaving. I don't remember what floor he was on, and I don't remember the name of his doctor on his whiteboard, which may have been a chalkboard back then, but I remember it was Friday, and I was 19, and I had been in the ICU waiting room all night with my friend Dex. Hours before, I was splicing film at the movie theater where I worked, 16 miles and 30 years away from the operating theater where I will be cut apart and spliced together. I was preparing for the long night ahead of watching all the new releases to make sure we put the film together in the right order when I got the call I had been anticipating for 11 years, ever since Dad's first heart attack. He's in the hospital. You need to come. I had been preparing for this day since 1976, rehearsing eulogies and phone calls, trying to cry all my tears out before his final day so I could take care of everyone else. I have since learned this process is called anticipatory grief and that it is common and that it doesn't help prepare me for grief in any way, not one bit. But I didn't know that yet, and when I left the movie theater and drove to the hospital in my orange AMC spirit, I felt like I was falling into a well-rehearsed script. 
Part of me was outside myself, watching me drive the few miles north to the hospital. You must remember this, myself outside myself told me. This is important. I watched myself walking to the automatic doors, pressing the up button at the elevator bank, noting how dry my eyes were. It had worked. My planning had worked. My tears were used up. My mother was there, red-eyed and silent. At some point, a nurse asked my mother for the list of all my dad's medications, which she had also anticipated and pulled from her purse. My friend Dex arrived, and we went to sit in a waiting room with black faux leather furniture and a soda machine. And we waited. I don't remember why we didn't go see him. ICU rules were different then. Maybe we did, and I don't remember. Even when I know, I must remember, I don't always. Dad had a DNR, a do not resuscitate order, but he'd collapsed at home, blood kissing the carpet, and my mother couldn't refuse to call the ambulance, and the ambulance, once called, could not refuse to come. Dad had anticipated this day as well, but his plans were thwarted and he was alone in a hospital room, the one place he vowed he would never die. He'd spent many years of his life in hospitals, from months in the polio ward in Wilmington, North Carolina when he was seven, to weeks in ICU when he was 36 after his first heart attack, or myocardial infarction, the doctors would write in their secret book of code words, to multiple bypass surgeries, hoping to prolong the time until this long anticipated day arrived. Mom left to go take a shower and I was alone in the faux leather waiting room. Dex had left to go to work and I was lying on the couch when a nurse came in and said, if you want to see your father while he's alive, you need to come now. I have since learned how they know when someone is about to die. They look for blood pooling in the toenails, a catch and pause pattern in the breath, but at the time I thought she was somehow magic. I went with her and I really wish I had gone to see him sooner, but if I did, I have repressed it and saw him thrashing on the bed, his head looking far larger than it should be. He was tethered to machines as well, which ones I do not know, but he'd been restrained to the bed at one point. I learned later he'd been trying to pull the tubes out, had been trying to die on his own terms. That's the thing about hospitals. They're not so keen on your dying, intent on attaching you to any number of things to make sure you breathe a few more hours. They don't ask you what you want. I am learning this as I lie in Honor Health Hospital, Scottsdale Shea Medical Center's Oncology Recovery Ward. They do not ask me. They just do. I don't remember if his room had a window. I don't think it did. I stood too near him and too far away. I have always regretted not crawling into the tiny bed with him and holding him, but we didn't do that in life, and it felt invasive to do it during the dying. I didn't sing to him or put on his favorite music. I watched him drowning in air like fish on a boat deck, gasping for the water, gasping for home. I felt the tears rising, the water swelling in my chest, but I held it tight as I had been taught to do, lest I make anyone else uncomfortable with my emotion. He coughed and I coughed and I couldn't keep the ocean down entirely. I love you, I said, which felt strange to say in the open room because we didn't say that much in life either, but we both knew it to be true. His death was not peaceful. It was late morning on Friday. I was supposed to be in class at the community college where I had chosen to go rather than accept a scholarship out of town because I knew, had anticipated, that this day would come and I knew I would carry the not being here heavier than the being here. I could live with delaying college. I could not live with missing his departing. He tossed from side to side, still trying to pull loose the tethers. I was a tether. My mother was a tether. He was trying to cut us away too. Mom was still not back. But I had anticipated this moment, he and I alone, and it had arrived according to script. His head fell back to the pillow. He pulled at the tape on his arms. It will be soon, the nurse had said, soon. Exhausted, he inhaled jagged and exhaled loud, and I caught his breath in my own fractured inhale and closed my lips around it as the machine's lines went flat. There was no beeping because he did not want to be saved. His mother had tried a lifetime to save him, to convince him to confess his sins to Jesus so he would be healed, but nothing came of it. When he was 40, he fled the weight of the saving, taking us 2,000 miles away from North Carolina to the deserts of Arizona, and in his final act of defiance in a hospital room, refused it again. There should have been a song. Maybe a few bars from Elvis, 
young Elvis, hopeful Elvis, alive Elvis, but there wasn't. There was only me holding his breath in my lungs for the next 30 years. I want to pull at my tethers. I want the catheter out, the oxygen out, the morphine out, the glucose drip out. I want to walk on my own and pee and poop and eat food with my teeth. I want to pluck my chin hair and stand under a hot shower. Each of those things will happen over the next few days or the next few months. The hole in my vein where the tubes lived will seal. My blood sugar will normalize. The robot kisses will fail and my elimination system will find a new pattern. These tethers will go, leaving me with the strongest invisible one, the tether I connected to my father's ghost. The big cats wrestle in silence on the television. My chakra music has ended and I can't quite reach the iPad because, you know, tethers. I don't know what comes next. Did they find more cancer? Had it spread? What is going to happen to me? No one will say anything. The surgeon will see me tomorrow, they say, as if only he can deliver the definitions of the codes they all must know. Maybe I will be able to drink bone broth on my own. Maybe they will cut me free from one of these clear plastic ropes. Maybe it has metastasized. I do not want to die. I need water. I turn to access the call button and I see my father, his breath still buried in my cells, has returned. I reach for his face. It must be the morphine. I must have hit the release by accident. He catches my hand in his, and his eyes are the exact blue I remembered. He whispers something low. Say it again, say it again, I can't hear you. But he's vanished, the jumble of his words dancing in my ear, the damp hot of his breath evaporating on my neck. So this next piece is the voice of the raven. So that's the ghost of my father, and this is in the stage play format. Um, and the raven's voice is actually really written in more of a prose poem. And this does follow directly the piece I just read. Raven. I remember you, my daughter, before you were you. I watched you grow beneath my wife's belly, felt your feet kicking the walls of her womb. Always running you were, always trying to get out, get away. But when you were born, you wouldn't walk. Not for three years. You sat and you crawled and you watched, and then one day you got up and walked into the next room and closed the door. <laughs> that was you. And that was you in relationship to us, to your mother and me. We could come close, but not too close. We could watch you watching us from your playpen, but from the very beginning you were a closed book, and I knew then what I know now. You had taken on a burden that wasn't yours. You would come into the world not just with her eyes and jaw and my love of language and history, but you came with the ghosts that made us, us. Had we known creating a child forged a link not just to the best of us, but to the parts of us we wanted desperately to erase, would we have made you? Would we have anchored another soul with our ghosts? Maybe that is all human creation is, a stringing together of ghosts born from one flicker of love, one sigh of release, a way of tethering us all together so that we don't get lost in the dark. You'd think I'd know these things now that I am here. I remember you watching me when I was dying. I was back in the hospital and I see in that, and I was in that damned pastel gown with the snaps and I wasn't conscious but I had never been more awake. You wonder about these things now that you have been in the hospital. I watch you, I watch you, you, I watch. You know you're close when you feel both limp and living. Your body is asleep, but you, you begin to crackle and unfold, and you never realized how big you were, how much space you could have taken up, how much of yourself you could have shared. I wanted to reach to you, but my arms were shackled to the bed because I had tried in the night, unconscious though I was, yes I was, but still, the part of me that transcends me had tried to untangle myself from this body to remove the tubes and needles and silence the relentlessly squawking machines. When you were about to burst with breadth and depth, you know it will only be a few moments. And you want to resist like how you, daughter, wanted to resist the anesthesia before surgery, but always it is stronger. It is a tidal wave at the edge of your consciousness and you surrender to it without trying to, even if for a moment you plan to anchor your defiant feet in the shifting sand. I wanted to reach to you, but we had not been a tactile family, too much Lutheran, too much Baptist, 
too much discomfort with the messiness of flesh, but I knew in that final dermal moment that to touch the skin of another was to touch the face of the God I had long wrestled with. To touch the, fa the flesh of another was to hold the very miracle of the cosmos, that 98.6 degree fire threading through us all. I wanted you to touch me too, but I knew the beeping scared you, the thick restraints on my wrists, the unconscious thrashing of my body that was trying to kick loose my soul. I was breaking free of my bone cage at the same time I was reaching for you and the full moon tide was coming and I could taste the salt spray on my lips and she smelled of life and my body twisted and I tugged at my chains like a Victorian ghost, but they were not chains at all, only flaccid representations of the human hope of permanence. The nurse brought you into my room that morning. Alone you were, alone, only 19, 19, only alone, and she told you I was leaving, and you watched like you had watched me from the moment you opened your eyes, from your curl in the crib to your petulant high school pout, to this instant where we found ourselves on opposite sides of the river. I watched your birth passage thrashing and bloody and dark, and you watched my death slide, and I wondered for a blink who was waiting for me to emerge, flesh suit shed, shimmering sparkle of dust, and I wanted to bring you with me, not to take your life from you, no, 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 but to take my very best thing with me. My daughter, my daughter, I wish so much I could have stayed, stayed, could have saved you. So I struck a bargain like Robert Johnson, song and guitar at the Delta Crossroads. Just a little bit more time, just a little bit. You see, my daughter, my daughter, she will need me soon. But the full moon tide kept rising. It's heard this song before, so much before, that it, can, that it has a response. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? Amen. Who wants to be saved? I do. I do. Who wants to turn it over now? I do. I do. The tide is rising. The salt is churning. And the undertow has wrapped its fingers around me. And I have one second left to memorize your face. No lines yet. No lines. No gray. And I watch you swallow my tide, lapping at the muggy air in the sterile room, gulping your own rising tied back, squeezing your eyes closed to hold the water line at bay. You are watching me, still tossing on the bed. You are watching me, slipping out behind my lips into the fluorescent room. You are watching me, last gasp, death rattle, death rattle, only the shaking off of the lost tendons that held me, held me to my house, my house, my lungs, my spleen, my liver, my kidneys, my useless leg, my heart, my heart, my heart. How well you have done for all you have suffered through how well you have done. My daughter, my daughter, drink me in this moment, our moment. Please, please, just a little more time. I come to the crossroads. I come. I come. Thank you.